Most people who do philosophy have a certain central question, an existential question that accompanies most of their lives. You write different works, you write different books, but I believe that you are basically asking the same question. For me, the issue is how to reconcile universalistic principles of human rights, autonomy and freedom with our concrete identity as members of certain communities divided by language, by ethnicity and by religion. Sheila Ben-Habib, professora de filosofia política, vê a democracia como um encontro entre a utopia e a fronteira. Existem limites para os direitos e a dignidade do outro? Que papel tem a diferença na vida democrática? Que papel para a religião, o género, a origem nacional, a cultura? O processo democrático é feito de repetições e revisões. A liberdade é ao mesmo tempo individual e coletiva. Para Sheila Ben Habib, as democracias são sempre feitas de muitas e múltiplas liberdades. I was a student in the American College for Girls in uh, Turkey uh, um, and I was uh, the newspaper editor and uh, One of the conflicts that was going on was, uh, at the time, uh, rights of demonstration simply in solidarity, you know, with the, uh, with the workers in, uh, who were on strike. And I wanted to write an editorial in my student newspaper about this. And my headmistress invited me to her office and uh, told me in no uncertain terms that this was not a good idea. And, um, you know, this was a very liberal school, much more liberal than Turkish, you know, high schools. I mean, it was an American college, but there were still limits to what the student, to what, you know, would be tolerated in a student newspaper. So it was in some fundamental way, you know, an, an experience also of freedom and its limitations, you know, the wish to express solidarity and then to be told by the authorities that no. But uh, furthermore, because precisely because we were in an American school and precisely because one of the mobilizing angers behind the 1968 student movement was the Vietnam War, uh, this became at times difficult for us. What do I think freedom, uh, uh, freedom means? Um, um, it, I don't know that, you know, it's a term that permits a simple and single definition. Of course, it's an idea and it's an ideal. It is crucially related to uh, concepts of uh, self-determination the capacity to exercise uh, autonomy over the conditions of one's existence, the capacity to um, even shape one's choices uh, in life according to some uh, correspondence between one's abilities and one's uh, talents and opportunities, what I call the moral psychology of freedom, or what do you want to be when you grow up, right? It's a question of, but this notion of self-determination and collective um, choice, collective life together, they are fundamentally, they are fundamentally uh, related because uh, freedom is an aspect of our social relations. 
uh, Robinson Crusoe may be uh, free, but even he has his man Friday, and Robinson Crusoe is more free than his man Friday, who is still his servant, right? So freedom is also fundamentally not just what I can do, not just what I'm able to do, but what I have the moral obligation to do, as well as the political and legal right to do. If I can give you an example that is not all too um, uh, remote, um, about 10, 15 years ago, maybe, you know, in maybe not even 2007, 2006, uh, uh, two French journalists were kidnapped by Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And this was before even, you know, ISIS and so on, before the situation we face now. And uh, in return for their release, they asked from the French government that they lift the ban about the wearing of the foulard. And there was a huge demonstration in Paris at the, uh, against this. And uh, the women with the foulard, they went onto the street, in fact, with the foulard. French law was more liberal than, than it is now in recent years. And they had the tricolore uh, painted on their foreheads. To me, that was an example, you know, a brilliant example of democratic iteration because what they were doing at that moment was at one and the same time asserting their rights uh, as Muslim women to have their heads covered if they wanted to. They were asserting their rights as French citizens to demonstrate if they wanted to. And yet at the same time, they were saying, you know, to the Islamic militants who wanted to negotiate with the French government to change the law, no, these are my freedoms. Stay away. You have nothing to say about this, right? It's a very interesting moment for a democratic iteration. And that's not a repetition, because at that moment, you have to think about what the right to wear the scarf means. And it certainly does not mean that that woman is simply an object of submission. I'm not saying that this is not the case for many Muslim families, it could be. But at, at one at the same time there, you have to understand that this is a woman who has a certain subjectivity and who is capable of becoming a political subject by going out onto the street. And she's not just an object of oppression or an object of your pity or your compassion. So everything gets transformed in a moment, in a moment like that. And that's the process of democratic iteration. I developed this concept, democratic iterations, to think through uh, two issues. One was the issue of rights. How are rights claimed by particular social groups for themselves? And second, uh, how are universal uh, rights claimed uh, for various uh, uh, groups? And, uh, primarily, I was thinking about the way in which, uh, although we share a certain principles and take certain fundamental rights um, in a liberal uh, democracy, let's uh, say something as fundamental as you know, gender equality, that the process of democratic iteration contextualizes and concretizes these rights. And I'm very interested in this problem of contextualization. Uh, of rights, because I think that there is a great deal of misunderstanding about the nature 
of the new political discourse and the new transnationalism, uh, particularly with the emergence of these transnational movements that like the ecology, like the women's movement or movements for global, what are called movements for justice in the global south, they combine the uh, local and the global in very interesting ways. And for me, democratic iterations is a term whereby we can, we can think about uh, the way that uh, that struggle takes uh, place. Now, when we come to the scarf affair, it is, I think it's become a symbolic it's become a symbolic issue. It's the symbolic issue of the presence of the Muslim migrant within a Christian Europe. And what to do about it, what to do about the status, the status of uh, women. Uh, should they adjust, adopt to the laws of the country that they're in? And again and again, the European Court of Human Rights, to the surprise of many, has ruled that no, this is not a human rights issue. There is no violation of fundamental religious freedoms involved when governments deny uh, individual, you know, Muslim women the right to wear the hijab to, to school or to something else. I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this has been consistent that the European Court of Human Rights has said, no, 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 this is up to the domain of the individual government and um, not an issue of uh, freedom of conscience. I disagree with that. I think that it has to be treated as a question of freedom of conscience and not as a question of uh, security and state interest, which the courts you know, usually are interpreting them at. So um, this just raises uh, such, a, such a rich area of um, investigation, and it is... Um, uh, it, the boundaries and the borders of the nation state become visible precisely because of this. Of course, in Europe, you now have a post-sovereign national entity because you have disaggregated sovereignty. You know, some, some, of us are, some of you are in the monetary union. You have, you know, joint border control. You have eliminated internal borders. You know, the borders are now, you know, defined uh, uh, farther and farther out a common uh, defense policy, common economic policy that is being negotiated, you know, social rights and so on. So this is, this is a, a post-sovereign, it, it, it's a post-sovereign develop, uh, development. And that raises, you know, again, it, it, it raises, you know, this question about the boundaries of the demos with all its, um, uh, with all its difficulties. This has been a central concern in my, um, in my work because there's been a, a remarkable uh, lack of um, focus on questions of um, what I call the boundaries of the demos in political philosophy. We have simply taken the nation state for granted. There's been a lot of writing in history and in politics about nationalism, about populism, about liberalism, and so on. But there hasn't been much writing at all about the nation state and its boundaries. And borders and boundaries are not the same. Borders are the physical marking, the territorial marking that is supposed to be under the jurisdiction of one state as opposed to another, right? A border usually it's either a fence uh, or you know some kind of an electric barrier or something or another or a wall. Most often, that demark. Boundaries are separations that mark separations between human communities. There are human communities on both sides of the border usually that are related to one another, very often who are related to one another, Mexicans in the United States and Mexico, or Kurds between 
uh, Turkey and Iraq and Syria. Uh, so boundaries are about the ways in which societies define themselves as we and they, us and the others. And those boundaries are historical, moral, religious, cultural, sociological. And um, the uh, issue is that uh, there is very often a, a decalage, a disjunction between the boundaries of the demos and the borders of the demos. Uh, if the demos is we, the people, we, those who are entitled to have uh, a voice, in most uh, polities, you have those who are subject to the laws of the demos, but who do not have a voice in the sense of a full voice in their articulation. This disjunction, uh, is a special dilemma for constitutional democracies. Because the assumption is that we, the people, are those who are subject to the laws which we give to ourselves. And yet the presence of migrants that are documented or undocumented, uh, the presence, the increasing presence of refugees and asylees, asylum seekers, within the boundaries of all these parties is creating the question of voice versus legitimacy. And so at a very abstract theoretical level, um, uh, democracies are beginning to suffer from the fact that the laws under which the demos lives applies to increasingly larger groups of people who are not part of the demos. So this is, this is a, a difficulty within, within a democratic uh, theory in thinking about the rights of migrants. Now this is, I'm talking about not entry, but I'm talking about those who are already there. The question of entry is something else. Now for those who are already there, particularly within the European Union, and let's talk about um, uh, within the European Union, cases like uh, Germany or Spain or Portugal, Italy, uh, that on the one hand, of course, you know, you have European Union citizenship. Then you have third country nationals. I would be a third country national because I'm not a European Union citizen if I came back, you know, if I came and lived in Europe. But then, of course, in the case of a country like, you know, Portugal, you have people from Mozambique and Angola who are there from your former colonies. In the case of Spain, you used to have many, many Latin Americans. In the case of France, you have, you know, Algerians, Tunisians, Moroccans. In the case of Germany, you have very large numbers of, you know, Turkish and Kurdish peoples uh, still. So one of the issues that is emer emerging here are the the political, cultural, and civil rights of non-members. And this is differentiated according to, to different uh, 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 groups. For example, refugees and asylum seekers, until their status is approved, do not have the right to take a job in the marketplace. But this leads to the situation I don't quite know how this is in Portugal, that they are sequestered in special homes. And because they are sequestered in special homes, they become the direct focus of attention um, and animosity of the local population because they are designated as being in that particular space. And it's very easy to attack them in that particular space. Should they have the right to work? Shouldn't they have the right to work? What do you do with their children? What happens to the children when they have to go to school? In a similar way, this situation is creating problems of uh, legitimacy, voice, as well as questions of integration. We will praise the importance of face-to-face -face negotiation. You, you refer to things that are very personal uh, in the political realm, like dignity, recognition. 
And we are living this oh, this revolution in, 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 in with the internet and social media that a lot of people say has political consequences. How do you see this uh, relation between technology and all these processes of iteration, renegotiation in, in, in democracies? I think that the, this new technology, uh, particularly the worldwide internet, um, maybe um, Facebook, maybe the social media, are uh, have turned out to be, you know, media for mobilization, for the dissemination of uh, information. In that sense, you know, they have solitary, solitary effects. Um, um, but I uh, would also like to emphasize the quality of fragmentation that is also tremendous uh, with the social media. Uh, you have friends on Facebook and you can block those that you don't want to be your friends. So it's very easy to start living in a universe, a little bit of your own creation. You log into the news sites that you want to read. You don't have to read the morning newspaper. You just get in the headlines that are relevant to you from whatever site that you're looking at. And there's even this concept now of infotainment, information and entertainment. So the danger here is that on the one hand, there is a tremendous amount of material out there, which governments are having very difficult time to control. I mean, Akea Snowden and, you know, and um, the revelation of all uh, government uh, uh, secrets and the kind of embarrassment that that is causing. And yet at the same time, this unbelievably fragmented uh, fluid uh, aspect of the, of the media. So, uh, I um, I think that it has some salutary effects in terms of um, decentralizing um, uh, control over news. I mean, there is, I think that there is now more information available to larger numbers of people more quickly than at any other time in human history, okay? I mean, even I, as a university professor, sometimes quickly go to Wikipedia, check something, you know, deal with this information. I don't, if I don't have the encyclopedia at home, I don't have to go to the library, I do it there. You know, so this is, this is something new. But what bearing does this have on democratic deliberation? Is it helpful? Is it distracting? Uh, does it uh, contribute to it? I think this is hard to measure. Um, what it contributes to deliberation is unclear to me. In fact, it may also be a source of fragmentation and polarization. But it certainly you know, has a lot of beneficial effects on political life in terms of mobilization, in terms of transparency, in terms of putting pressure you know, on public officials, in terms of access to information and education, but how exactly it could be a tool for a better deliberation is not quite clear to me.